Hey guys, um, this is Andrew, um, reviewing Jean-Paul Sartre's, um, took forever for me to get that name right, you know, um, Nausea, his, uh, little background on Sartre, um, he was born in 1905 to 1980, um, these are just, you know, uh, facts you can just easily look up online, but I figured I'd just add them in there just to get a general background of him. Um, he was part of, you know, kind of one of the original proponents of existentialism in, uh, especially in the 1940s with Camus and, uh, his lifelong par partner, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, um, and they, uh, he wrote this, I believe, in the mid-1930s, and it's his first novel. Um, by the way, I'm going to be referring to some notes here because I am very, I know for a fact there's going to be something where even if I do get, even if I do think I hit every single point, I feel like I'm going to, oh darn, there's something like in hindsight, I guess, I'm going to be looking back and be like, oh darn, I should have added that part in. So, as, uh, just please bear with me as I awkwardly go through these notes. Um, but, yeah, so it's been, I have to admit, it's been almost a year since I read this, um, and so it's, I had to definitely, uh, you know, it's, some of it's getting into the point where it's getting kind of rusty, trying to recall certain themes of it, but it's, um, so it's about Antoine Roquentin, um, again, I'm probably butchering that name, and, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of just about him wandering through, uh, what's presumed to be just, I guess, uh, his home city, um, and kind of just reminiscing and kind of uh going through deep uh phases of like depression and he finds himself um ruminating over this girl named annie and he uh it's kind of implied that she was a love interest of him but then he's kind of like uh he kind of like holds her in this kind of bitter light because he's like um you know like it's implied that he feels bad about the things that he did and that she reminds him at reminds him of like kind of a of darker days and he's trying to like move on from that so um yeah and there uh there's so that she would be one of the main characters and uh Ogier P is also the self-taught man and a clerk and a friend of Antony who is uh, referred to as a self-taught man because he's kind of this autodidactic, you know, um, very well-read, you know, volum voluminous, you know, you know, reads like, you know, books at a library all day and that's his job kind of. And, and then, you know, he also has this very like humanistic view towards society where he's like, he sees them, he sees society with like this, like this kind of all-encompassing love in which uh, Antoine Quentin also kind of, even though he's a friend of his, he like kind of mocks that kind of humanistic uh, view towards society, and it's also implied. Well, I think it's actually outright said that he's a socialist too. Uh, so, yeah, as far as form goes, there's not like a lot of. Um, there's not any beginning, middle, or end. Um, it pretty much just kind of is just like a meditative, fly-in-the-wall, observational, detached, you know, like, almost like a gritty type of realism, you know, and that's not a bad thing, it's just, on a personal note, it is a bit hard to read, like, when you're trying to, like, pay attention, and you're trying to, but it's kind of, you know, like, the, the main character does go through kind of, like, these, uh, you know, cycles, where it's like, you, you know, wander from cafe to cafe, kind of, you know, uh, it's almost like a Romain de Clef, a little bit of Sartre himself, like a, a bit of a self-insert, not to the point, you know, not like a Woody Allen level of egomaniacal type of self-insert, but there is like a, you know, a veiled type of thing of like Sartre himself was one of those, um, kind of wandering, was one of those like youths, intellectuals who wandered around Paris and went through Par Parisian cafes and, you know, um, would, would spend time there kind of arguing uh, you know, having these deep philosophical discussions with other members of the cafes, and, um, yeah, so that's definitely, that's definitely what Antoine does throughout this novel, is just kind of goes through that, so it's kind of a little bit hard to, um, like, you get, by, the, by like, the fifth time, he's like, oh, back to this cafe again, and, you know, it's past midnight, and drinking coffee, and, you know, and, uh, arguing with my, uh, intellectual kind of, 
contenders and it's like eh, but like about like the 50th time it gets a little old but that i get that's the point because it's like life you know according to sartre doesn't really have you know i mean that's his motto right existence precedes essence it's like there's existence and then there's just nothing which is, which is what his uh philosophical work you know his great grand big uh you know like dissertation being a nothingness uh i keep wanting to say being in time which is another book by heidegger which he also actually mentions um he goes to kind of like uh he doesn't like take down heidegger he doesn't he doesn't like 100 percent disagree it's like more so he's just kind of like fix he's like attenuating or you know kind of responding to that and and a bunch of other things it's like a really big thick tome um and so much of it went over my head when i read it but um but this is like different this is a novel um it is it has characters it has um like a lack it has a lack of structure like i said um but it's a novel and it's there's definitely themes in it and um yeah so the main title of the book is nausea right so that is basically a self-described feeling by the main character um of basically this extreme depression that's kind of put on and brought about by this um like the sudden absurdity of existence like you notice that all of a sudden that existence makes no sense and that you're here and then you're doing these things and you're just going through the motions and you're it's like circuitous and there's no telos or or end you know there's no end religious goal there's no grand narrative um so yeah that's kind of what i think there's like a very beautiful piece from the book i can't find the life of me where he says something like uh antony says like uh something something effective like release me from the sins of existence or something like that so it's like very um very meditative and kind of like you uh <laughs> a little bit tough to read like i said but overall i definitely recommend it i definitely it's one of those things where it's just like there has to be kind of maybe the right mood calls for it maybe and i i definitely would read it kind of at a slower pace to like kind of take it all in um so a little bit more of a background on existentialism uh some parts of it reminded me a bit of like kierkegaard in a sense uh who's kind of like the og of existentialism i like to think of him um albeit a christian variety but even still it wasn't in this like dogmatic like like he already made up his mind and saying oh christian you know like there is a god and you know there's and that rules out every other possibility it was obviously through his you know famous uh statement of a you know his famous description of a leap of faith taken by the knight of faith and that it didn't it you know it wasn't by any rational logical um uh it wasn't by any like rational logical means or discussion or proof like you didn't have to cook up these scientific proofs and anything or or like a you know or like an ontological argument like all these other people did but you did have to but it was a wholly on out of irrational just out of a um just like that's why it's called you know his main work either or uh his kind of most his biggest kind of magnum opus i think um goes through that it's like it's it's either life is meaningless and all these things are completely kaput and have no place and, and irrelevant and you should just you know throw your throw your throw in the towel with god and jesus and that his you know christian his danish christian variety of uh existentialism or you all these things like all these different ways and views of the world like the aesthetic view the uh the universal the hegelian dialectic and all that you know way of rationalizing and being a secular humanist that's the way to go like there's two ways of looking at it and i think sartre kind of i see a similar thing in the sense that uh kierkegaard and sickness unto death 
said something to the effect of like so, uh, so many times like when when you lose like a leg for example people your, yourself included obviously would be completely like out of your mind just being like oh my God. like it's it's so obvious you know the, the reaction that you get um that would be very dire but um whenever people when a, but when a man loses his soul as he says uh like nobody really blinks an eye like you don't really nobody bats an eye you know nobody loses a wink in of their sleep you know it's just completely almost like natural like it's so ubiquitous it's so it's so kind of um you know self-explanatory right so that's kind of the same mentality i kind of see with sarch um like nobody people go through their daily emotions and they nobody really truly like critically analyzes like what's going on why we're you know why we're here why we get up every morning and you know you know wander through <laughs> city streets having intellectual discussions even like even if that's your way of existence and that's kind of like why the self-taught man is different than him because i suppose brokenton is is um i guess the self-taught man sees this um grand purpose to his narrative like a hegelian type of universal spirit i guess and thinks that he has like a duty of some sort like he's like maybe maybe it's a kantian duty, kantian duty or something like that um but you see where Quentin doesn't really see like an actual end purpose to anything so there's that kind of um but um then there's Camus and this is interesting because he mentions that the humanism of the self-taught man right and that kind of reminded me of the humanism of Camus uh who's Sartre I think at his funeral when uh Camus passed away and after a car accident um said that he was like he described him as like you know uh, you know, Albert Camus was a, uh, was a great humanist, you know, uh, at heart or something like that. And it's definitely like very indicative of kind of like their relationship. Cause I think, I think, um, Sartre and Camus, um, definitely, they were both like kind of from di similar circumstances. They were both, you know, um, in the French resistance movement in, uh, the second world war and they, both kind of wrote these papers and I forget the name of the one newspaper that they wrote for um but that's kind of that's how they got their start they're kind of contemporaries in that sense but on the other uh side of the, of the coin uh Camus is very much uh wanted to distance himself from existentialism and uh and basically his view was that of the absurd which is you know there's definitely because I think with him there was more there's a little bit more of that Kierkegaardian type of leap of faith with him even though I, I don't think he was necessarily religious um but you see it later on in the plague like you see like kind of like this duty of which i'll have to review sometime um you kind of see this duty bound type of thing of like oh like in, instead of you know this plague that's so absurd right uh like one of the ways of dealing with that is like rather than running around like a chicken with his head cut off and you know, like oh what's going on and being reactionary or blaming it on people like you just need to like the doctor character for i can't remember the name but the doctor character basically is like is kind of has that duty bound you know like just show up and heal the sick and get and don't question it and like so there's that sense of kind of that um kind of stoic humanism to him as well and you definitely saw that differing in their friendship definitely um but yeah a personal note i actually went to france in paris and uh saw the cafe de flores i think it's called and uh yeah it was a place where apparently uh sartre and other intellectuals too um would that's like one of the main ones he'd frequent uh and yeah i thought it was really interesting because it was it was kind of funny because uh one of the main the one of the waiters had like this was like what one of what Sartre would might call what might call a uh Sartrean Sartrean uh waiter in the sense that he was like very rigid and like <laughs> like he like he thought of his existence to be that of a waiter rather than a um a person first so he's he's going through all the motions and he was very like can I get you anything like this and like 
going back and forth very um, mechanically, but you're very nice, so it's not. But it was like in that kind of, that almost like a little bit too robotic in the sense that I guess what, that's what Sartre was getting at in being a nothingness. I just thought it was kind of funny. Um, so yeah, definitely recommend it. Um, like I said, it's a little bit tough. It's a little bit of a challenge to read. I definitely would go through it gradually and slowly and try to, you know, try to really absorb it. And yeah, that's all I have for today.